So just some announcements. With Dave Retarin, the church phone number is changing. So I'm gonna announce that this morning. So if you wanna get your phone out and take down this number, um, it's 074 281 29295. Um, and that's how people can contact the church from now on. Um, we do have a church phone. It's not solely Dave's responsibility anymore. He's probably really happy that he doesn't have to answer his phone all the time. Um, but that phone will be passed between the elders on kind of a, a rota basis. Um, so when you call that, you might get a different elder um, each time you call. But we'll still all be working together to resolve whatever it is that you call us about. So we're just going to begin this morning and pray. Um, so kids, if you want to take your hands, open, open your hands like this. Adults, you do it as well. And I want you to do a big clap above your head like this. Oh, I didn't do it very well. Try again. Woo! And as your hands, keep your hands together. And as your hands go down, as they pass your eyes, close your eyes. And as they pass your lips, close your mouth. And let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you so much that you're with us this morning. Thank you for your great love for us. And Lord, I just pray that as we renew our commitment to you this morning, that you would um, show us anew what you've done for us, sacrifice that you made for us, and how much you love us. Help us to worship you in spirit and in truth this morning. Not just when we um, worship through song, but when we are praying, when we are reflecting. Lord, let everything this morning be an act of worship for you. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. So today we are doing something a wee bit different. Um, we're doing something called the Covenant Service. And really the Covenant Service is, um, it's a Methodist church service. So you might've heard of a denomination called Methodism. Um, and in Methodism, every year in the first week of the new year, the first Sunday of the new year, they hold a Covenant Service. Um, it's not the first Sunday of of the new year, but we are doing it today um, because it's after Dave's retirement and it just felt like a really um, significant way to kind of bring in the new year and to renew our commitment to God. Um, so in the Covenant Service, that's what it's about, renewing our commitment to God. Um, it's about thinking about the covenant that he's made with us and it's about us saying, Yes, God, I am going to follow you with all that I am and all that I have, and I will lay down my life to follow you. So it's quite serious, um, and I would encourage you, there's bits that you have to read out off the screen during the service, and I would encourage you that if, if you don't really mean the words on the screen, then don't say them. This is something that shouldn't be taken lightly. Um, we need to be serious about this because God is serious about his covenant so we need to be as well. So how exactly will it work? Well like I said there will be lots of responses, lots of you guys having to say things from the screen. The bit that I have to say, just me, is in plain text so just that black text on the screen. And the bits that you have to say are in bold and they're in green on the screen so hopefully you don't have any issues um, seeing green text. Um, they're the bits that you have to say. Interspersed throughout the service, there'll be some worship songs at different points. Um, at one point, there'll be a time of prayer where we actually confess the things that we've done wrong, the things that we need forgiveness for. And there'll be, you can sit and do that kind of in, in sight. There'll be music playing. You can sit and do that while the music's playing. Or um, there's a different option for that. You can do it a bit more practically. I'll explain that when that comes around. There'll be a short message. Um, so I'll be reading from John this morning um, and just talking a bit about what, um, what it means for us to be the branches and for Jesus to be the true vine and how we're connected with him. 
And then after that short message will be the biggie, the covenant prayer. And that is the bit that I would really encourage you to think seriously about. And if you don't mean what you're going to say, then don't say it. But we will have time in the service to reflect on that later on. So let's start off. Let's practice a bit of responding with, with our first wee bit. So my bit's in the black text, yours is in the green. Let us worship God who has established an everlasting covenant and calls us through Jesus Christ to be a faithful people. We are here to make our response to God. Praise the Lord, his mercy is more. Praise the Lord, his mercy is more, stronger than darkness, new every morn, our sins they are many, his mercy is more. What love could remember, no wrongs we have done, Omniscient, all-knowing, he counts not their sum. Thrown into a sea without bottom or shore. Our sins, they are many, his mercy is more. Praise the Lord, his mercy is more. His mercy is more. What patience would wait as we constantly roam? What Father so tender is calling us home? He welcomes the weakest, the vilest, the poor. Our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. Praise the Lord. His mercy is more, stronger than darkness, new every morn, our sins they are many, His mercy is more. What riches of kindness He lavished on us, His blood was the payment, His life was the cost. We stood with a debt we could never afford. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more. Stronger than darkness, new every morn. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more. Stronger than darkness, new every morn. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Amen. Let us adore the God of love. You created us, O oh God. You continually preserve and sustain us. You love us with an everlasting love. Through the light of Christ, you have given us the knowledge of your glory. We praise you. We acknowledge you to be the Lord. Let us give thanks for the grace of our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Though you were rich, yet for our sake you became poor. You were tempted at all points, as we are, yet without sin. You went about doing good and preaching the gospel of the kingdom. You were obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. You were dead, yet are alive forever. 
you have opened the kingdom of heaven to all who trust in you. You sit at the right hand of God. You will come again to be our judge. You, O Christ, are the King of glory. Let us rejoice in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. You are the giver of life. By you, we were born into the family of God and made members of the body of Christ. Your witness confirms us. Your wisdom teaches us. Your power enables us. You will do far more for us than we ask or think. All praise to you, Holy Spirit. Let us make our confession to God. Merciful God, in Christ, you have shown us the way of life. We confess with shame our slowness to learn, our failure to follow, our reluctance to bear the cross. Have mercy on us and forgive us. We confess that too often we have impoverished the life of the church by the half-heartedness of our worship, our neglect of fellowship and the means of grace, our hesitating witness for Christ, our evasion of responsibilities in your service, our imperfect stewardship of your gifts. Have mercy on us and forgive us. We confess that too little of your love has reached others through us. Often we've been hasty in our judgments, grudging in forgiveness, slow in reconciliation, unwilling to help our neighbour. Have mercy on us and forgive us. In this next little bit, we're going to make our own confessions to God about things that we need to have him deal with in our lives, on your seats. There are little um, square, they're like post-it notes, um, we white pieces of paper. And you should have a pen as well. If you don't, there will be a seat that has one on it so you can go and, go and grab one, or there are some over there on that wee stage bit. Um, you can use the white little bits of paper to write down things that you need to confess to God, stuff that you've done wrong that you need him to deal with. As you're writing them down, ask him to forgive you. And once you've done that, scrunch up the bits of paper and walk to a bin that you see. Um, obviously social distance when you're doing this, but walk to a bin and put it in the bin as kind of a physical um, act that shows what God has done with our sin. He's put it in the bin. <laughs> um, he has forgiven us. When we pray and ask him for forgiveness, when we confess our sins to him, he will forgive us. So you can confess in whatever way you like. So let us, each of us, make our own confession to God.
Make us pure in heart, O God. Breathe into us a new and faithful spirit. And here's some really good news. If we confess our sins, just as we have done this morning, God is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Therefore, I can declare to you that we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Hallelujah. He's so good. Let's all say the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Now we're gonna just have a wee look at the word this morning. Um, and we're coming up to the point in the service where we make our covenant promises. And you're probably still wondering, yeah, I mean, you've talked about this covenant thing. What's it going to be? Um, I will let you have time to examine it before you have to um, say the words so that you can prayerfully consider it before you say it. Um, but before we do all that, I want us to have a think about this passage from the Bible. John chapter 15, verses 1 to 8. And just before we do that, I'll just pray. Father, thank you that you have forgiven us. Thank you for your covenant, which made a way for us to come into relationship with you again. It's just incredible that you know, no one could enter your presence. Um, and now we can. You're here among us. We are standing on holy ground because you're here. Lord, as we read your word and as we think about what you taught us what it means to um, be one with you. Um, Lord, I just pray that you would speak to each one of us. Speak to us clearly and um, identify things that we need to change. Challenge us this morning. Um, don't let us leave the same. Help us to tune into your voice, Lord. Help us to drown out um, all the noise that's in our heads, whatever has been going on these last few weeks, whatever's gone on this morning. Lord, just take it all. And silence all that noise and speak to us. Help us to hear you. In Jesus' name, amen. So if you've got a Bible on your phone or if you've got a physical Bible, then you can turn to John chapter 15 and we're reading from verse 1 all the way through to verse 8. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. And this is Jesus speaking. I am the true grapevine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit. 
and he prunes the branches that do bear fruit, so they will produce even more. You have already been pruned and purified by the message I have given you. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine, and you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. Yes, I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Anyone who does not remain in me is thrown away like a useless branch and withers. Such branches are gathered into a pile to be burned. But if you remain in me and my words remain in you, you may ask for anything you want and it will be granted. When you produce much fruit, you are my true disciples. This brings great glory to my Father. Amen. So this is Jesus speaking and he is talking about a grapevine. And we don't see many grapevines today, but they would have been really um, common in the place where Jesus was. Um, they would have been all over the place. They were really, really useful because from the fruit, you could, you could dry the fruit, you could eat it fresh, you could make wine out of it. Um, there's loads of things that you could do with, with the grapes. So they were kind of all over the place. They were, um, yeah, they were really popular trees, plants to grow. And I have on here a little diagram of a grapevine because I didn't know what a grapevine looked like. I had to Google it. Um, so there's a wee diagram of one. Now, I'm not going to get into the anatomy of, of a grapevine. Um, but you can really picture what Jesus is saying when you have this in front of you. When he says, I am the grapevine. So if you see the big trunk thing in the middle, I am the grapevine and you are the branches. You see those shoots coming off that, that branch there? That's what I picture us to be like. And those grow the fruit. And here is a picture of a real grapevine. It's very, very beautiful how it grows. You would think that it would snap, <laughs> but it doesn't. It's very beautiful. So Jesus says he is the grapevine. These are the characters in this story that Jesus is telling. Jesus is the grapevine. God, our Father, he is the gardener. And we are the branches. These are the key characters in this little parable that Jesus gives us. Um, and, you know, it's lovely to think of God being the gardener, the one who kind of tends to us and looks after us and make sure that we are producing the right amount of fruit and it's, it's just really lovely to have that image of God because it just shows him as caring and kind. Um, a grapevine like that, that takes a lot of work to make it look that way. Um, and if you don't, if the gardener doesn't tend to this properly and look after it and prune it, then Google told me it will just grow out of control and it won't be very fruitful at all. Um, there'll be hardly any fruit growing on it. So this takes a lot of work and God as the gardener is the one who does the work in this story. Us, the branches, all we have to do is grow. All we have to do is be connected to the grapevine. That's all Jesus asks of us. And there are some really amazing promises in this passage. Verse four, Remain in me and I will remain in you. And then the next promise lays on from that. If you do that, if you remain in me, I will remain in you. And if you do that, you'll produce much fruit. And then another promise following on from that. 
If you remain in me and my words remain in you, then you may ask for anything you want and it will be granted. Now this verse has been taken out of context so much. Um, some crazy televangelist people that you might see on the TV like to take this verse and say, you know, Jesus said we could ask for anything and it will be granted. So, you know, you pray and you ask him for that new BMW car and you pray and ask him for that mansion with the swimming pool and, you know, winning the lottery and all this kind of stuff. But that's not what it means at all. Not one single bit. They have just taken that verse and twisted it. From this passage, it's clear. We are being asked to be connected to Jesus. We are the branches. He is the grapevine. He provides us with everything that we need to grow, with everything that we need to grow fruit. And when we are connected to Jesus in this way, when we remain in him and he remains in us, his priorities become our priorities. So your motivation when you pray is no longer your own desire and your own wants and your, your own whatever. It's nothing to do with you when you pray. When you're connected to Jesus in that way, it becomes all about what he wants. And so Jesus is saying, you may ask for anything you want and it'll be granted. He's saying, you know, my priorities are gonna be your priorities now. I want to see people come to know me. I want to see people set free from their sin. These are my priorities and they should be yours now. If you ask for any of this stuff, it'll be done. That's what, he's, that's what he means. So it's just incredible. The promises that Jesus gives us when we are in that relationship with him, when we remain in him, he promises to remain in us. And something I love about that as well is that Jesus doesn't say, you know, if you remain in me and say your prayers 10 times a day and um, prayer walk around same three times a week and know all the answers to every single really difficult theological question that exists and you know, he's not asking you to be perfect. <laughs> he's saying, remain in me. It's all about relationship. So I've got a little table. Because the passage as well shows us the difference between remaining in Jesus and those who don't remain in him. There's a clear difference. There are opposites in this passage. So we'll just explore those a wee bit and my lovely neat handwriting. So remain in me. If we remain in Jesus, we are connected to him and we are connected to the Father. Because if we are a branch, we're connected to the grapevine physically and the gardener comes to us and he tends to us. He makes sure that we're okay. He looks after us. On the opposite side of that, if we don't remain in him, then we are disconnected from Jesus and we are disconnected from the Father. If there's a branch that isn't producing fruit, if, if it's cut off, what good gardener is gonna go to the dead branch on the ground and look after it? They're just not. If we don't remain in Jesus, um, we'll be disconnected from Jesus and from the Father. Then the next point, if we remain in Jesus, it says in verse five, we will produce much fruit. Now, what does he mean by fruit? We don't all walk around with bunches of grapes hanging off our arms. The Bible tells us what fruit looks like. In Galatians chapter five, it says, the fruits of the spirit are love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. This is what fruit looks like. So if we remain in him and he remains in us, we will produce much fruit. We will be kind when people aren't kind to us. We will be joyful in the face of 
um, suffering in the face of you know, circumstances like we're in right now with COVID when we can't go anywhere. Our joy will be in Jesus. We'll be joyful. We'll have peace. Peace that passes all understanding is how the Bible describes it. Patience, those people who really rile us up and get us angry, we'll be able to be patient with them. I could go on and on and on about the fruits of the Spirit, but that's what fruit looks like. And yeah, it's just the best kind of fruit, way better than tasty grapes. If we don't remain in him, then we're told in verse four that we won't produce fruit. So all those things, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control will probably really struggle with if we aren't in him. We can only do those things through him. If we remain in Jesus, we will be tended to by the gardener, the good gardener who is God, our father. And when I was thinking of this, I was just imagining um, a gardener, for some reason he looked like Trevor, just because I've seen Trevor Garden. <laughs> um, just really, lovingly going to the grapevine that we saw um, in the previous picture with his gloves on and his little pruning scissor things and tenderly just looking at every single little bud and examining each branch and seeing what he needed to cut off. Um, yeah, that's just a beautiful picture. And if we don't remain in him, it says we'll be thrown away by the gardener. Verse 6. They're thrown away like a useless branch and they wither. Such branches are gathered into a pile to be burned. And, you know, to me this talks about what will happen. Um, if we don't know Jesus, when we come to the end of our life, we won't be able to be with him in heaven. We'll be thrown away. And that is a really hard truth, but it is true. Um, so we have to make sure that we remain in him. And if we do that, he will remain in us. Another key thing about remaining in Jesus is that we get an identity from remaining in him. We are his true disciples, verse eight. When you produce much fruit, you are my true disciples. So we remain in him, he remains in us, we produce fruit, we are his true disciples. On the other hand, if you don't remain in him, your identity is that of a useless branch which again is really hard to take, but it's the truth. If we don't remain in him, then we are like a useless branch. Now, you are probably wondering, what on earth does all of this have to do with the covenant? Because it's covenant Sunday today. Well. Technically not, but we're doing it today. The covenant is a fancy word for God's promise. God promised in the Old Testament hundreds and hundreds of years ago, before Jesus even came on the scene, he promised that he was going to save us and he promised he was going to love us. And he fulfilled those promises by sending Jesus why did he send Jesus? Well, I've got a really good little video. I was going to explain it all and then I saw this video and I thought, no, this video talks about it way better than, than I can. So I'm going to show you this video. It's called the 321 Gospel and it explains exactly why Jesus came and what he's done and what this covenant promise means for us. 
Three, two, one. The story of God, the world, and you. Three. God is three persons united in love. In the beginning, there were three, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Not three different gods, one God who is an unbreakable unity of three. A triunity, or trinity. The trinity is not a maths problem or an ancient riddle. It's the good news that God is love. Forever, the Father has loved his Son in the unity of the Spirit. How do we picture this? Well, the Son of God is the image of God. He gives us our window onto God's life. So, for instance, picture his baptism. There we see the Holy Spirit descending on him while the Father declares, You are my Son who I love. With you I am well pleased. That's a snapshot of God's eternal life. The Father has always been loving his Son with the joy of the Holy Spirit. But this love was too good to keep to themselves. The God of love wants to share. And so the Father made a world through his Son and by his Spirit because he wants billions more children to join the family. You and I were made to hear his verdict. You are my child who I love. With you, I am well pleased. The meaning of life is to find our place in the three. Two. The story of the world is the story of two men. God placed one man, Adam, at the head of the world to bless it and care for it. But through mistrust, Adam turned from God, turned in on himself, and plunged the world into death and curse. It was a cosmic fall from grace. Now we all share in this broken humanity, and we feel the curse of this broken world. The human race is like a Christmas tree that's been cut down and wrenched from its natural habitat. We might dress ourselves up in fancy decorations, we might perform all sorts of good deeds, but we're perishing. We have no spiritual life in us, and we're headed for the rubbish dump. The race of Adam stands under God's condemnation. God has pronounced an eternal no to that way of life, because he wants something very different for us. He wants us all to find true life in a second Adam. Jesus Christ. At Christmas, Jesus came as a man. He entered into our broken world and took up our lost cause. Like a champion who wins the contest for us, Jesus stepped into our shoes and lived the perfect life we could never live. Then on the cross, he died the cursed death that we should die. He summed up Adam's nature and curse and took it down to the hellish death it deserves. But three days later, he rose again to a new life beyond death and curse. And he invites us into his life and into his family. 1. You are one with Adam. Will you be one with Jesus? The human condition is Adam's condition. As chips off the old block, we share in his selfishness, his death, his disconnection from God. One with Adam, we have no life in ourselves and no hope for the future. But Jesus comes to offer a stunning oneness with himself. Like with the Christmas tree, we can be snipped out of the Adam tree and grafted into the Christ tree. Or think of another picture of oneness. We can be one with Jesus, like in a marriage. Imagine a marriage between a prince and a pauper. She is filthy and poor with a shameful name and a hopeless future. Yet the prince loves her and offers himself to her in marriage. As soon as they're united, what happens? He takes all her debts, she gets all his riches. He covers over her shameful name and gives her his name. She's invited into his life, his family, his inheritance. Through her prince, she can call the king daddy, and all because of their marriage union. It's just like that with Jesus. If we receive him, all that is ours, our sin and curse, becomes his. He pays it all off on the cross. And all that is his, his righteousness and inheritance, becomes ours. If we're one with Jesus, right now we're adopted into the family. We have his spirit as our spirit. We have his father as our father. We belong to his brothers and sisters in the church. We call on the same father and hear his love spoken to us. You are my child who I love. With you, I am well pleased. These are our privileges now, and when Christ returns, we will also share in his physical, immortal life. He will raise us bodily and set the world to rights. On that day, God will judge the world, forever confirming his no to Adam 
and his yes to Christ. You are one with Adam, but there's no future in that life. And with arms outstretched, Jesus makes a proposal. He offers you himself, his very life, his family, his future. He's yours if you'll have him. Be one with Jesus. The three invite you in. The two determine the world. Will you be one with the Son of God? So this is what Jesus has done for us. This is the covenant that God has made for us. Jesus came so that we didn't have to live under the curse of our sin. He came so that we could have life and life in all its fullness. And these are the lengths that he's gone to because he loves us. Jesus' dream for us, God's dream for us, is to produce loads of beautiful, juicy fruit that love, that joy, that peace, that patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. All that juicy fruit that shows off the skills of the gardener, our father. So what do we have to do? How do we, how do we enter into this? What, what do we, how do we have a part in this? How do we have that relationship that we saw in the video and the relationship that we read about this morning about remaining in Jesus and him and us? Well, first of all, the very first step that you have to take is you have to pray. You have to ask God to forgive you for all that you've done wrong and all that you're doing wrong. Ask him to help you change and tell him you're sorry. Ask him to be in charge of your life. Tell him that you don't want to be in the driver's seat anymore. That you, want, <laughs> that you want him to take the wheel. Make a commitment to live for him. When we do all that, we become Christians. That's how a person becomes a Christian. When they make that commitment and that promise... So if you've done that, that's incredible, that's awesome. But then after that, you've got to remain in Jesus. Remaining is a continual action. You don't just do this one-off thing and then that's it. You can forget about Jesus for the rest of your life and do what you want. No, you've got to remain in him. And remaining is all about praying, doing what you did at the start, Praying and asking God to forgive you for the things that you've done wrong. Asking for his help to turn around and not do those things again. Saying to him, okay God, please take over my life and be in the driver's seat. I don't want to be in control anymore. Doing that continually, not just as a one-off thing. Remaining looks like reading your Bible. Remaining, remaining looks like asking Jesus to be your guide. Not letting things like wanting to fit in or having more or better stuff guide your choices, but letting his will guide your choices. Remaining looks like being in a community of people who are also trying to remain in Jesus so that you can try and remain together because you're not in this alone. There's a whole bunch of people who want to produce fruit like Jesus talked about. So that's what it looks like. And that's where this covenant promise comes in. So every year I've said that the Methodists do this, they renew their commitment to God every single year. And they've been doing this since the 18th century. And I, I'm, I consider myself a Methodist still, even though I'm not in the Methodist church. But when I was in the Methodist church, this covenant was my favorite service of the whole year because it allowed me to take stock of my life and in some cases to go what am I doing and to say right God I lay it all down at your feet just take me and use me so in a few minutes you'll be invited to say the words of the covenant 
And as I said earlier in the service, this isn't something you should take lightly. Um, we just fling words around effort, effortlessly these days, especially on social media and especially in the current political climate. Um, we are so quick to use our words as weapons to not think before we speak. But we need to be a bit different with this. Um, this is not something that we should take lightly. We need to be serious when we say these words. Because, like I said at the start, God is serious about his covenant with us. So in a few minutes, I'm going to invite you all to join me in saying the words of the covenant. But before we do that, it's so important that we actually think about the words that we are going to be saying. And to think whether we can actually pray this prayer. So I've got a little worksheet here I'd love you to take a look at. If you're watching online, you'll see it on the screen in front of you. And it basically tells you what the words of the covenant are that we're going to be saying in a few minutes. And there are some reflection questions. So I'll just read those questions out. Read through the prayer slowly, a line at a time. What jumps out at you? What would you find easy to say? What would you find difficult to say? Think how it might apply to your life, the whole of your life. What things might God be asking you to stop? What might God be asking you to continue? And what new things may God place in your life? If you're following online, you'll see the covenant and the questions on the screen. And I would invite you to just pause the video for a few minutes and work your way through this sheet. So now we come to the covenant and I've got a few things that I've got to say um, in the, the black writing and then I'll invite you all to join in when you see the green bold writing again on the screen. The covenant. In the old covenant, God chose Israel to be his people and to obey his laws. Our Lord Jesus Christ by his death and resurrection, has made a new covenant with all who trust in him. We stand within this covenant and we bear his name. On the one side, God promises in this covenant to give us new life in Christ. On the other side, we are pledged to live no more for ourselves, but for him. Today, therefore, we meet as generations before us have met to renew the covenant which bound them and now binds us to God. Beloved in Christ, let us again claim for ourselves this covenant which God has made with his people and take the yoke of Christ upon us. To take his yoke upon us means we are content that he appoint us our place and work and that he himself be our reward. Christ has many services to be done. Some are easy, others are difficult. Some bring honour, others bring reproach. Some are suited to our natural inclinations and material interests. Others are contrary to both. In some, we may please Christ and please ourselves. In others, we cannot please Christ except by denying ourselves. Yet the power to do all these things is given to us in Christ who strengthens us. Loving and holy God, with joy we take upon ourselves the yoke of obedience 
and for love of you commit ourselves to seek and do your perfect will. We are no longer our own, but yours. I am no longer my own, but yours. Put me to what you will. Rank me with whom you will. Put me to doing, put me to suffering. Let me be employed for you or laid aside for you, exalted for you or brought low for you. Let me be full, let me be empty. Let me have all things, let me have nothing. I freely and wholeheartedly yield all things to your pleasure and disposal. And now, glorious and blessed God, you are mine and I am yours. And the covenant now made on earth, let it be ratified in heaven. Amen. Therefore, let us make this covenant of God our own. Let us give ourselves anew to him, trusting in his promises and relying on his grace. Amen. Father, thank you that you promise to always be with us. Thank you that you keep all of your promises to us. And Lord, as we walk through this life, the exciting stuff and all the boring stuff, may we know your presence with us in a very real and tangible way. And now we'll say the grace together. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. What we did about was Joshua and the walls of Jericho. And um, because they obeyed God, obeyed God and went round Jericho seven times, and then the last time they blew the trumpet, blow your trumpet, come over here, Jordan. Blow your trumpet. And then they shouted, hey! yeah! And then the walls fell down. But the one that fell down is the big Is that right? Mm -hmm. And there was one lady.